How's it going ladies and bruises up Bobby Six Killer and welcome to an impressions video we're going to be doing on a game called Choices That Matter and The Sun Went Out. Now this is a, I think this was in our Games of November video as well. Um, this is a choice based text adventure game. Apparently there's 2500 choices, shitloads of endings. Uh, it's all text. So we're going to be reading. Lots of reading. But um, <clears throat> it seems like it's going to break down similar to how the Zero Escape or, or Birth Me Code um, chains of logic break down, you know? Should be interesting. Should be interesting. Sounds like it's going to be interesting. Might turn this into a series. We'll see how it goes anyway. Day 95 in the orange pool of gas that sustained life on this planet for billions of years was still burning in the sky. The scientists were completely wrong. Thankfully. Something vibrated on my wrist. I raised my hand and studied the watch-like device. <clears throat> it was a, it was Modicon, or simply Modi, as, as I called them. Hello, teacher. The temperature this afternoon is a crisp 30 degrees Fahrenheit. I do hope you're wearing your warm jacket. Don't forget that you also need to pick up your travel documents from Miss Montagnu. She's expecting you at her home. Stepping out of the train car, I adjusted my coat. Moti was right. I should have worn the one with the wool lining. Too late to worry about it now. Dolores Montague's house wasn't too far away from the station. As my boots crunched through the snow, I felt Moti vibrating on my wrist. As ever, Moti's cheerful face greeted me. You've just received a message from Professor Sol. He's insisting that you see his latest breakthrough right away. Pff, visit Professor Sol, of course. Dolores could wait. Even if Sol's matter wasn't urgent, he'd become unhinged since the incident. We'll swing by Professor's place first, Modi. Send a message to Dolores to let her know that we might be a little late. Okay, would you like to review the message I composed? Okay. Dolores, I'll be slightly delayed, unfortunately. Is this med message adequate, teacher? It's pitch perfect, Modi. I knew you could do it. Thank you, teacher. I've sent the message. Before I knew it, I was trudging through the bitter snow on the professor's front lawn. There was a dull, muffled noise coming from inside the house. I pushed the buzzer next to the front door and waited. Yes? A voice came through the intercom. It sounded a little strange. More than the usual, anyway. It's me, professor. I'm in the basement. There was relief in his voice. That was the sound of the door unlocking. Taking that as an invitation, I opened the door and let myself in. I noticed a large suitcase sitting in the front by the front door. From its bulging sides, I had the impression it was overpacked. Was Sol going somewhere? He hadn't said anything about a trip. Examine. I knelt by the luggage and examined it. There was a tag labelled Flying Falls. Why was the professor going there? More importantly, it looked like it was packed in a great hurry. The professor wasn't exactly a beacon of tidiness, but this was messy even by his standards. The spatial efficiency in the suitcase is very poor. I recommend repacking it, teacher. I chuckled as I stood up and walked toward the stairs. I'll pass your advice along to Professor Bodie. I opened the door to the basement and gingerly felt my way down the wooden stairs. It was pitch... it was black as pitch down there. I could barely see in front of my face. Suddenly I was hit in the face by a strain... by a the light switch cord as I fumbled to grip it. A voice rasped in my ear. No, it must remain dark. Jumping from the shock of hot breath in my ear, I let go of the cord. Why can't I turn on the lights? Don't ask foolish questions, come here. A dim glow appeared, highlighting a disheveled, unshaven face. His reddened eyes bore into mine as he beckoned me over with a bony finger. I hesitated, remembering what happened last time. Come on, man, let's do it. Slowly, I inched towards the professor, scattering papers with frenzied scroll and scrawled litter, scrawling, littered the desk and floor, an ocean of ideas, spilling out from the brain and flooding the dark room. Something caught my eye. You saw it too. Sol's tone reached fever pitch as a grimly a grimy figure pinned the paper with a strange symbol. It began to ramble incessantly about theories and equations. 
scanning the desk, I noticed his battered diary with a lock. I wondered if its contents were more comprehensible than the professor. Examine. While Sol was absorbed in his mad rantings, I lifted the book in my hands and turned it over. Noticing that I had his diary, the professor finally stopped talking about his theories. It's locked, he stated before continuing on, and on with his theories. Teacher, my linguistics processing unit might be damaged. I'm unable to understand Professor So. I swallowed a laugh, knowing I had to gain control of the conversation somehow. So I interrupted. Why did you call me? Call you? I didn't call you. Are you sure? Something about the sun? So paused for a moment and looked at me excited. Yes, the sun. It all comes back to the sun. People have a right to... A glint caught my eye from the top of the stairs and I instinctively stepped back. Sol cried out, then slumped to the floor. Professor! I leapt to his side and, my, and fluttered my hands over his chest, desperate to stop the bleeding, but not wanting to hurt my friend. Hands shaking, I glanced back at the top of the stairs and spotted a shadowy figure running off. A gurgling sound made me turn my head back to Sol. He looked like he was trying to tell me something. What are you trying to tell me? I was never much good at anatomy in high school, but I knew what the chances were that he'd survive. I tilted my head and lowered my ear as close as possible to the professor's mouth. My heart thundering. Nothing. He was still. Soul? Teacher, the professor has passed. Damn it! Suddenly cursing, I was about to pull my trembling hand away from his chest when I felt something under the professor's lab coat. Steadying my hand, I reached in and pulled it out of his pocket. It was a card sleeve containing a printed bus ticket, emblazoned with the red and white Coyote logo of the long distance bus company. Itinerary scanned and stored, travel destination, Flying Falls. A single thought broke through my shock. The murderer was getting away. Not having any time to think, I pushed the ticket into my pocket, ran over to Sol's working desk and pulled open the top drawer, knowing what I'd find inside. The professor's revolver. It was a small gun, at 8 inches in length, it made it was made of sturdy stainless steel. I glanced over at Sol's lifeless body one last time. I'm sorry, Professor, I whispered. I snatched up the revolver and leapt up the stairs. The murderer couldn't have gone very far, not with the adrenaline pumping through my veins. I could see the door swinging wide open from the attacker's intrusion. Charge through it. Unwilling to risk losing Sol's murderer, I held up my gun and charged toward the exit. Bam. The door flung open as I burst into the bitter cold of the street. Hurriedly, I scanned my surroundings. But there was no one out there. Teacher, the fresh footprints leading to the left. There are fresh footprints. Thanks, Modi, I said. Followed the trail, my boots sinking into the snow with each heavy step. Desperately, I scanned the street for anyone suspicious. The street was completely bare. Look at my luck, like my luck had run out when suddenly... There, someone was getting into a bus. That could be them. But before I could go after them, I noticed something else. Slipping into a nearby alley. One or the other. It couldn't be both of them. Chase the person down the alley. The shadowy figure disappeared into the alley and I crunched through the fallen snow in hot pursuit, skidding around the corner, my feet pounding the concrete. There, a tall person wearing an overcoat and a hat was running down the alley. They were too far away. I had to get their attention or they'd escape. Sol told me everything. It didn't work, not even a little. The person continued running at a surprising speed over the snow. Cursing under my breath, I plotted the revolver at the figure, my hands shaking. Keep chasing him. I don't want to shoot anyone. I lowered the gun and continued my pursuit on foot. I followed them into the alley and saw that the person had stopped in their tracks. They stared at me and I couldn't help but gasp. Most of their face was hidden by their scarf, but I could see their eyes staring into my own. They glinted gold in the light, unsettling me. The person gave a muffled chuckle. Then they turned and ran, scrambling over the fence. Hey, stop! Realizing I lost, I was losing my one lead, I continued to chase after them, only to stop at the fence. Climb over the fence. 
I braced myself and took a running leap at the fence. I'd make a good start. I began to easily climb the wire when I misplaced a foot on the slick diamond mesh. There was too much ice. I barely managed to keep my balance as I hugged the fence. Keep climbing. After taking a deep breath, I continued pulling myself up the fence with both my arms, trying to keep as much weight off my feet as possible. The ice had made the wire footholds unreliable. When I finally reached the top, I swung one leg over. But before I could swing my other leg over, I slipped again. Only this time, my hand slipped, and I fell helplessly over the other side of the fence. The last thing I remembered was the snow-covered concrete rushing towards my face. I opened my eyes and stared up at the cloudy sky. I was on my back with snow in my clothes and hair. Teacher? Teach you, are you okay? I'm fine, Modi. I said before wincing from pain at the side of my head. I touched it and looked at my fingers. Flakes of dried blood. My head was bleeding, but no longer. How long was I out? Only five minutes, teacher. Please, you must go to the hospital. You might have con concussion. I think we have time for that. Five minutes is more than enough for the murderer to disappear. Feeling like I was missing something, I searched my surroundings. Then it hit me. Professor Sol's revolver, it was missing. Golden eyes must have taken it. Then I felt my phone vibrating in my pocket. Nothing I can do about the revolver now. Modi, who's calling? It's Miss Montagnier. It's her fifth call. Five calls in the past five minutes? Put it through, Modi. Actually, she's been calling for ten minutes since during your pursuit. I'll put it through now, teacher. I heard the call connect. Dolores. Is everything okay? What? Of course not, Dolores answered, sounding bewildered. How long are you planning to make me wait? I winced, this time not from physical pain. Sorry, I'll be there as soon as I can. Just hurry up. She hung up the phone before I could say anything else. I would have told her about Sol's murder otherwise. While I was stuffing my phone back in my pocket, I felt an unfamiliar weight in my jacket. Pulling it out, I recognised the object immediately. It was Professor Sol's diary. I must have taken it by accident after the chaos with Sol. It suddenly occurred to me that all of Sol's research, which I needed, was still in the professor's basement. On the other hand, I made Dolores wait long enough, and I really needed the itinerary from her. Teacher, what should we do? Um, we can do a Sol stuff later. I mean, it's not going anywhere. We'll quickly swing by Dolores to get our stuff, and then we'll go to Sol's. Ready? Stepping out into the main street, I flagged down a taxi. It was already mid-afternoon, and the snow-covered roads were about to get busier. Yes, teacher. It took me a moment to notice that Modi didn't have her, their usual jovial chirp. I'll be fine. My head doesn't hurt that bad, so quit worrying. Yes, teacher. I sighed and didn't say anything else. Your friend's having problems, asked the taxi driver in a gruff voice as he switched to a faster lane. I turned to the driver. He had a neatly trimmed beard and a pair of red racing gloves. My friends have all having panic attacks since that funny business with the sun, he continued. Not that it's ever bothered me. Your friends have been having panic attacks? The taxi driver grunted, oh yes, can't even sleep with the lights off anymore. These are grown people, can you believe it? I wasn't sure what to say, maybe they're afraid of the, the sun thing will happen again. He shrugged before whispering conspiratorially. Had a government official in my car yesterday. Word on the street is they're going to heavily subsidize Xanax to keep the population sedated. Xanax? What the hell is Xanax? I nodded. It was news to me, but it didn't come as a surprise either. After about 15 minutes, just as the taxi pulled into South Street, Dolores called me again. Must be to complain about my tardiness. Dolores, before you say anything, I'm practically there already. Oh yes, I hear you at the door now. The door? Dolores, that's not... She hung up. Unsure what to make of that, I looked out my window as the taxi approached Dolores' house. The front door was obstructed by wooden fencing, so I couldn't see who was there. Something didn't feel right. I hurriedly paid the driver and jumped out of the taxi when... The gunshot came from Dolores' house. I sprinted along the fence and then, through the gate, the front door was slightly ajar. Please be careful, teacher. Modi's right. Carefully, we don't have a gun now. Someone's in, someone in the house had a gun, and I had no weapon. I had to be cautious. Keeping my form low and my footfalls light, I made my way to the front door of the house. I peeked through the crack of the door before nudging it open. There was no one inside. 
Satisfied that the living room was safe, at least, I stepped inside. Petra, looks like there's been a struggle in here. Wadey was right. Some of the furniture was broken. A table lamp was smashed on the floor. Shards of, the, of a vase were scattered around the room. A bloody bread knife was laying in the middle of the room. The trail of chaos led me, trail of chaos led me to Dolores' bedroom. One of the hinges of the bedroom door was broken, as if the door had been kicked in. There was a large open window in the bedroom, the curtains fluttering in the cold winter wind. There's a high probability that Miss Montague has gotten away. I looked out the open window. I hope you're right, Moti. There were tracks visible for a few feet, but they joined a well-traveled pavement after that. Pedestrians were about in South Street, and no one was acting strangely. Only moments ago, Dolores and her attacker were here, and yet I was unable to track them. I highly recommend we leave, teacher. Someone might have reported a gunshot. Not yet, Modi. We should look around a bit more. Okay, where should we begin? From where it starts, in the living room. Unlike the bedroom door, the front door wasn't damaged. The door chain must have been released from the inside. Dolores must have opened the door for the attacker, thinking it was me. I knelt by the blood-stained bread knife in the middle of the room. It wasn't dry yet. Hopefully the blood belonged to the attacker. The quantity of blood is not significant, teacher. The damage is probably not life-threatening. Thanks, Modi. That was a good thing, at least. I wasn't sure I could cope with two deaths in one day. I scanned the walls, floor, and ceiling of the room, hoping to find a bullet hole. There's a bullet hole in the wall behind the coffee table, teacher. I went over there and examined the wall. Good spotting, Modi. Glancing over at the front door, then at the broken lamp next to the coffee table, I was convinced that the shot came from the front door, went through the lamp, and into the wall. I smiled in relief. That was good. That probably meant Dolores wasn't hit, or if she was, it was a through and through. Did you find what you're looking for, teacher? I shook my head. Not yet. Dolores is supposed to pass me the itinerary today. It might still be in the house. Okay, where do we look next? Uh, bedroom, I guess. There was a large footprint in the frame of the door leading to the bedroom, and the wood was splintered around it. I glanced over at the heavy looking dresser next to the door, and it wasn't flush against the wall. Looking down, I understood why. There were drag marks on the floor, clearly a sign of the dresser being moved. Dolores must use this dresser to barricade herself in her room before her attacker forced the door open. It appears Miss Montague brought herself enough time to get away, teacher. Agreed. That was a good thing, at least, and the relief flooded through me. I went over to the dresser and started rummaging through it. Just clothing. Then I went through the box underneath her bed. Bills and various paperwork. Nothing out of the ordinary. Finally, I opened her wardrobe, revealing a safe sitting in the lower left corner. Do you know the combination, teacher? No, Modi. The safe looked sturdy. There was no way I'd be able to force it open. I don't think we'll see inside the safe today. Teacher, I'm picking up sirens heading our way. We should leave before the police catch us in here. We haven't found the itinerary yet. Still, Modi was right. I couldn't afford to be arrested. If I was Dolores, where would I hide sensitive documents? Probably not in the safe, since that would be too obvious. Think. Then it hit me. Secret compartments. Dolores loved those. Could she have hid one in her house too? Teacher, we have to hurry. Alright, let's look for the compartments quickly. I heard police sirens approaching too. They weren't very far away. Just a little, lo little longer, Modi. My chest was thumping as I ran around the house, pushing and knocking anything that could be a secret compartment. I looked under the carpets, I tried to move the bookshelf, I tapped the insides of the kitchen cabinets. Whoop whoop! <laughs> Police car had driven up to the house. <laughs> just as I thought I was just as I was about to give up, I looked in one last place. There it was. Wrapped in plastic and submerged in the toilet tank was a folder, just the right size for a travel itinerary. Not having any time to actually inspect the contents of the folder, I grabbed it and dashed out of the bedroom. Open up, this is the police. I wasn't able to leave through the front door, so I headed for the bedroom instead. The police had broken through the front door. My chest was thumping as I climbed through the bedroom window, trying my best not to make any noise. Once outside, I ran over to the side of the house, ducking under the windows. I do not see anyone in the police car, teacher. Thank goodness, both police officers were inside Dolores' house. Taking advantage of this opportunity, I walked past the p park police car and then down South Street as casually as I could. After a few minutes, I finally breathed a sigh of relief. Somehow I'd managed to avoid being spotted by the police. I'm very happy we managed to avoid prison, teacher. If I was confiscated by the police, I'd be all alone. I wouldn't let that happen, Marty. 
Thank you, teacher. Feeling the adrenaline still coursing through my blood, I hailed a cab. Are we returning to Professor Sol's place now? Yes, Modi. I had no idea where Dolores could have gone, or if she was even alright, but there was nothing I could do about that. What I could do, however, was recover Sol's research. By the time I arrived at the professor's place, it was already starting to get dark. The door was slightly ajar. Letting myself in, I headed straight for the basement. Once inside, however, I felt like something about the room was different from when I was there last time. Teacher, there's a missing item in this room. I did not need Modi to tell me what the item was. It was Professor Sol's large chest, which usually contained all his research work. I was too late. Someone had already taken the professor's research. Cursing under my breath, I went towards Sol's body instead, intending to search it. However, before I could do so, I hear police sirens teach her we should go. Unwilling to risk another close call with the police, I immediately left the basement, ran up the stairs and out of the house. This time I managed to make myself scarce before the police had a chance to spot me. We should go home as soon as possible, teacher. It's not safe out here. I sighed in disappointment and exhaustion. Marty was right. I needed to return home, and quickly. Something was happening, and I wasn't sure what. Um... Take a bus. The journey home was past in silence. I watched as the snow started falling again more heavily than before. Whether or not the colder weather could be attributed to the sun incident was a hot topic among meteorologists. When I finally walked into my apartment, Modi pinged me on my wrist. What are we doing tomorrow, teacher? That's a good question. I reached into my jacket and pulled out the itinerary from Dolores. I should stick to the plan and head to Peru. Then I reached into my pocket and pulled out the Flying Falls bus ticket. Why had Professor Sol been in such a hurry to get there? Turning it over, I noticed something peculiar in the back. Full Central Bus Terminal, 6pm. Who was Sol meeting in Flying Falls? Teacher? We're going to Flying Falls, Modi. Okay, teacher, Flying Falls it is. I gotta know. As I lay on my bed, I thought about the events of the day. What had happened to Sol and Dolores? It couldn't be a coincidence they were both attacked on the same day. Was the murderer after the research or something else? I felt fatigue take over my body, my mind sinking into slumber, stealing a moment of peace. Arc 1 completed. Good, good. You and 33% of players will be taking them. Okay, well, um, not many people have played it yet, I would imagine. But, you know, begin arc 2-3. Might as well kick it off. Good morning, teacher. The temperature this morning is a cool 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Flying Falls is expected a high of 35 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and below freezing during the night. I suggest you pack your warmest clothes, teacher. I groaned as I rolled out of bed. I hadn't managed to sleep much. My mind kept returning to last night's events, dissecting every little detail and making sure I hadn't missed anything. I kept wondering if I could have saved my colleagues. Thank you, Modi. Is there any update on the news of Dolores or Professor Sol? Yes, teacher. The police have released Professor Sol's name to the public and confirmed that his death was a homicide. Miss Montague's case has been labelled a domestic disturbance and her whereabouts are still unknown. They have not, as of yet, connected the two cases, teacher. Best they don't, Modi. Packing the few things I would need on my trip did not take long. I'd learned recently to pack light and swift at the last moment. Once I was done, it was a simple matter of opening the safe. I hid behind my bedside dresser and storing my few valuables away. When I got to Sol's locked diary, I decided against st storing it in the safe. Within its pages might be something useful, assuming I was able to open it without damaging it, and assuming I was able to decipher the handwriting. I was ready. I took one last glance around my home. I had no idea how long this trip would last. It could be a while before I next laid eyes on familiar comforts. Let's walk, Modi. Are you sure, teacher? It's very cold outside. I know, Modi. I just feel like walking. As soon as I stepped out into the street, a gust of ice, icy breeze bit into me. Every surface had a few inches of snow on top of it. The entire street glowed white as the sun rose behind the city skyline, casting a silhouette against the golden sky. The sounds of children laughing just ahead of me drew my attention as snowballs were tossed back and forth. Ducking under a flurry of icy projectiles with a smile, I started towards Central Station. 
It wasn't too far away, so it shouldn't take too long. Brace yourself for the frozen hell. I glanced over at the doomsayer in the plaza. He wasn't the only one in the plaza. There were two people, a man and a woman, listening to him intently. Old doomsayers weren't exactly uncommon since the incident. This one seemed grimmer than the rest. You. The doomsayer suddenly turned, his finger pointing unmistakably at me. What will you unbelievers do when the sun dies again on the hundredth day? Stunned, I shift my gaze uncomfortably between him and the couple. Ignore him. You cannot run from frozen hell. All material things will be frozen over. All your, all your loved ones will be frozen over. When I reached the end of the plaza, the doomsayer finally gave up and turned back to the couple as he continued spouting his prophecies behind me. Truth was, I didn't blame him. No one was ever able to satisfactorily explain why the sun inexplicably vanished from the sky for three hours. Not even me, and it was my job. When I got to the station, I looked at the back of the Flying Fool's ticket once more. Who was the professor meeting at 6pm? Teacher, our bus should be in ILE. Thanks, Modi. I crossed over to the other side of the station, watching as a bus or two arrived and left in the other aisles. The bus waiting in aisle E had a large red Coyote logo pasted on, painted on its side. The electronic display on the front of the bus said Flying Falls, Quebec. I was going to Canada? I suddenly realised I knew nothing about Flying Falls. Noticing that the other passengers had already boarded, I climbed into the bus and took a seat next to the woman in a business suit. She was typing something into her smartphone. She seemed busy. Ask the woman about Flying Falls? She's busy. Let's ask Modi. Tell me about Flying Fools, Modi. Looking it up on the internet now. Flying Fools is the collective name of two waterfalls in Quebec, around 80 miles north of Montreal. Waterfalls? Like Niagara Falls. Yes, teacher, they are similar tourist attractions. Flying Fools is also popular for owl watching. What are the waterfalls like? The large waterfall, Seraphie Falls, is 110 feet tall. There are seven stainless steel bridges at various heights so tourists can get closer to the falls. The other waterfall, Chiroptera Falls, is only 80 feet tall. The vegetation along the falls is home to many avian species. There is an observation deck for bird watchers. Flying Falls sounds like a nice destination for a vacation. Now that I thought about it, I've never seen the professor take a vacation, not even at Christmas. We can visit both Seraphy Falls and Chiroptera Falls, teacher. Sure, if we have time. I understand, teacher. Work comes first. Yes, work comes first. The bus pulled out of the station and began and started heading toward, heading northwest on the highway. After about fifteen minutes, the building outside the window turned into an empty, into empty snow-covered fields devoid of civilization. Teacher, now's a good time for a nap. A nap? Why a nap? I suddenly had an uneasy feeling. Wait, how long before we get to Flying Falls, Modi? Approximately six hours, teacher. Six hours? That would mean I'd arrive at Flying Falls around 5pm, an hour earlier than the time scribbled on the back of Sol's ticket. It'd be a long trip, but at least I'd be there on time. I looked out the window again, admiring the snow-covered fields. I felt my eyelids droop comfortably over my eyes. I could use a little nap, make up for the sleepiness, sleepless night I had. Wake me up when we're almost there. Okay, teacher. I relaxed into my seat and stared out the window. The snowy landscape was glowing in sunlight. I shut my eyes temporarily to rest them. My eyes snapped open. Matey was vibrating on my wrist, presumably to wake me up. It appeared I'd fallen asleep after all. All those recent late nights were catching up on me. Good afternoon, teacher. How was your nap? It was good, thanks, Matey. I breathed in sharply when I turned my head toward the window. The view outside was magnificent. We were driving in between two high cliffs down a twisty, winding road. If we missed a turn, we'd fall to our deaths into the frozen river far below. A pair of humongous waterfalls were just visible in the distance, a cloud of thin white mist rising from the bottom. We were heading for the small town next to the waterfalls. As we approached, we went through an archway with a giant sign of a full moon silhouetted by an owl. Ten minutes later, I was stepping out of the bus with the other passengers. Uh, I don't know what that says. Welcome to Flying Fools. It repeated in English. The signs around the terminal were both in English and French too. While staring at my arms and legs, I spotted a large sign on the wall saying, Full Central Bus Terminal. It was the location scribbled on the back of Sol's bus ticket. 
It is 5.45 p.m., 15 minutes before the time of Professor Sol's rendezvous. I am sorry, teacher. It appears my travel duration estimate is incorrect. I failed to account for the road conditions leading into Flying Falls. We still got time. That's alright, Modi. Only 15 minutes left. I didn't have much time to prepare. Let's you might be waiting for Sol, Modi. They might be early. Okay, teacher. Most of the people from the bus had already left the platform, leaving only a handful. There was a happy couple from the bus who were currently looking at a map together. They were probably tourists. There, also, uh, there was also a teenage boy sitting on a bench at the edge of the platform. He seemed to be playing a game on his smartphone. There are not many people here, teacher. Aren't tourist attractions supposed to be more crowded? I nodded. Usually they are. I'm not surprised though. I've never heard of Flying Falls till yesterday. None of the people on the platform seemed like the person I was after, unless I had a teenage son I didn't know about, or was friends with a tourist-like couple. What do we do now, teacher? We should keep an eye on the couple and the kid. After a few minutes, the couple who were looking at the map walked out of the station. My guess was they were newlyweds, going by their shiny wedding rings and the wide grins plastered on their faces. The teenage boy had moved from his bench, he was still playing his game on his smartphone. Could he really be the one the professor was going to meet? It is one minute to 6pm, teacher. What do we do now? I walk toward the centre of the platform. Let's wait and see what happens. Okay. Just moments after that, a bus with a large Red Coyote logo painted on its side drove into the platform and unloaded a dozen or so passengers. The teenage boy jumped up from his bench and looked expectantly at the passengers exiting the bus. My heart skipped a beat. Was the boy the one? Before I could do anything, however, a middle-aged man emerged from the group and hugged the boy. Damn. I waited a few more minutes until there was no one else on the platform. They'd all left. I don't understand, teacher. Where is the person Professor Sol was supposed to meet? Maybe they know Sol is gone. That is indeed a probable scenario, teacher. Sighed and sighing in disappointment, I walked over to the bench and lay down on my back to rest a little. I froze. Something on the ceiling caught my attention. A wide grin formed on my face. Are you seeing this, Modi? Not all was lost yet. I see everything you see, teacher. The contact lenses are still functioning perfectly. It was a rhetorical question, I chuckled. I sat up and gestured at the ceiling. There are cameras here, Modi. I stood up and walked out of the terminal. Do you know what that means? We can access the recorded footage in the security office to find out if we missed anything. Bingo. I was now looking at the door labelled security personnel only. But how do we enter the security room? We talk our way in. I pounded my fist on the door and waited. I could hear some shuffling behind the door, followed by approaching footsteps. The door flung open, revealing a tall young man in a security guard uniform. Hi, I greeted him with a smile and gestured at the ceiling behind me. I need to access the footage from your cameras. The security guard blinked. And who are you? He had a strong French accent. Uh, I'm an investigator for a law firm. The security guard raised an eyebrow. What law firm is this? Deacon and Price, I lied. It's in Toronto. I was about to say Montreal, but then I remembered it, it was a French-speaking city. Toronto? The security guard narrowed his eyes suspiciously. That's very far, no? Why come here? It's very far indeed. We didn't have a choice. We believe our key witness came here recently. Key witness? For what case is this? A homicide of a teenage girl. A horror, a look of horror crossed the security guard's face. Someone murdered a teenage girl? Yes. What happened? I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to discuss the details I answered, but the surveillance footage could be the key to cracking this. Please. He looked to be deep in thought as he was sullen for a moment. Okay, he answered finally and invited me in. Teacher, it worked. I smiled and followed the security guard as he led me through the office area toward a small video room. Recording's here. He tapped on the large shelves opposite the two by three array of monitors with live security footage. Play the recordings there, he pointed at a single monitor, attached to a magnetic tape device, semi-hidden somewhere at the other end of the shelves. Okay, I'll leave you now, he said before going back to the office area, giving me some privacy. Is it bad to lie, teacher? Yes it is, we didn't have a choice, Modi. I understand, teacher, we only lie if there's no other choice. Browsing the shelves, I found today's tape with the timestamp 12pm to 6.30pm on it. The guard must have just switched out the tapes. I put in the tape on I put the tape in the device and hit play. The footage from all six cameras showed on the low monitor. I fast forwarded the video to 5.45 pm until I saw myself stepping onto the platform. 
Then I let it play at normal speed to see if anyone, there was anyone I missed in any of the six cameras. I stopped the video at 6.20pm. I don't see anything unusual in the feeds, teacher. Me neither, Modi. Does that mean they didn't turn up? Yes, perhaps I heard about Sol's passing on the news. A thought occurred to me then. Or well, maybe we are late after all. What do you mean, teacher? The meeting was at 6pm. 6pm today or yesterday? I dug up yesterday's tape and inserted it in the device. It was possible the professor had intended to come to, fly, come to Flying Falls yesterday, not today. I fast forward to 6pm and played it at a normal speed from there. There, almost right away, I noticed a man in his, around his late 20s on the platform feed. He was clearly waiting for someone to get off the bus. Suddenly I heard the door of the security office slamming shut. Someone's come in, teacher. Sounded like two men had just walked into the office. I was speaking in French. I didn't understand what they were saying. It's okay, Modi, I whispered softly. They can't see us back here. On the platform feed, it was 6.20pm yesterday, and it looked like everyone had left except that man, earlier. He looked confused and frustrated. Then, the man answered a call on his cell phone. After a moment, the man slowly sat down on the bench with a shocked expression on his face. The phone still pressed against his ear. You looked upset, teacher. I nodded. Devastated was more accurate. I didn't need to hear what was said over the phone to know what had happened. I'd seen that expression many times over before. Usually because I was the one who had to deliver the news. Suddenly both men walked into the video room, surprising me. The security guard was one of them. I moved slightly to the left to better hide myself behind the shelf. That was when I glimpsed the other man through the shelves. He was the man on yesterday's camera feeds. The one receiving the upsetting news of the phone at 6.20pm yesterday. Upsetting news about the death of a loved one. Teacher? The call that man received was about soul, Modi. My mind still racing through the possibilities, I watched as the security guard and the other man continued their interaction about a dozen feet from me. The man, the person soul was most definitely supposed to meet, looked haggard and unhappy. There were dark circles around his eyes, as if he hadn't had any sleep. He had short black hair and light grey eyes. His olive skin and sharp facial features suggested he had Middle Eastern heritage. The security guard was consoling and rubbing his shoulders and speaking gently. Dialect detected. Quebec, French. Would you like me to translate? I silently nodded, knowing Modi would be able to recognize that gesture. Translating. Unidentified man? I'll be okay, Pierre. Security guard, I'm here for you. Are you sure you're ready to work? Unidentified man? Yes, I need to do it. It was clear those two were friends. I wasn't sure if they were colleagues too, considering the other man wasn't in uniform. He was carrying a duffel bag and was dressed in a grey t-shirt and a pair of light brown jeans. He looked like he was just travelling. Where was the person reviewing the videos? Who? Oh? Realising the security guard was now talking about me, I instinctively tried to move deeper into my hiding place. Suddenly the other man turned toward my direction, speaking in hushed tones. Did you see that? It's just me, the person reviewing the videos. My heart pounding. A friend of the security guard stared at me as I emerged through the shelving area. Ah, there you are, the security guard greeted me in English. He started explaining to his friend what I was doing in the video room. His friend was frowning by the end of it, clearly unhappy about the situation. I'm sorry, but you have to leave. You're not allowed in here. We'll review the video for you, the friend said sternly while escorting me out of the video room. Is he the person Professor Sol was meeting, teacher? I subtly nodded for Modi. Curious about how exactly he was connected to Sol, I turned to him just before exiting the security office. I'm sorry if I caused any trouble, I apologised sheepishly. Extending my hand out to him, I introduced myself. The man blinked at my extended hand before tentatively shaking it. Etienne. He looked at me with narrowing eyes. Have we met before? I can confidently say we've never met Mr. Etienne, teacher. I don't believe so, I answered. Are you sure? I feel like I've seen you before. For some reason I felt nervous. Why would this man recognise me? The only thing I knew about him was that he also knew Sol. Could I trust him? Or should I keep it to myself for now? Do you know Professor Sol? A look of surprise crossed Etienne's face. You know my dad? Dad? I was a little surprised that he was Sol's son, considering the professor was Irish in heritage while Etienne looked Middle Eastern. Although, now that I really look at him, I was starting to see some similar features between the professor and him. Your last name is Sol? I asked instead. Etienne nodded. Yes. Who are you to my dad? How much shall we tell Mr. Etienne, teacher? 
I honestly hadn't decided. Not yet, I said instead. Let's go somewhere else. A look of realization crossed Etienne's face. I remember where I've seen you before. You're in one of the photos the police showed me last night. I was in a photo? He nodded and picked up his duffel bag. Yes, as one of his associates. He didn't have very many. Come this way. After a few minutes, we were outside the station, walking toward the town while it was snowing. I could tell that Etienne was still waiting for my answer. Your dad and I were friends. Etienne laughed. His voice was somber. My dad didn't have any friends. I smiled. No, you're right. I don't know if he saw me as a friend, but he was my friend anyway. You two worked together. I mean, worked together, didn't you? My son knew his father all right. I nodded. Technically, Professor Sol worked for you, teacher. Are you a scientist like him? Etienne asked. There was a sort of naivety in the way he worded the question. His Quebecian accent was almost imperceptible, but it was there. I shook my head. No, I'm an, I'm an investigator. I needed him to do the science. He nodded, understanding. What about you, Etienne? What do you do? Instead of answering, he flipped me a badge that said, Parks Canada. Teacher, Parks Canada is a government agency in charge of all Canadian national parks. There is a high chance he is a park warden. So what are you investigating? Etienne looked in my direction and suddenly stopped. Having a bad feeling, I turned to look at my other side. It was a pair of men, one tall and one short, just leaving a bar. I didn't recognise either of them. However, I could see their guns sticking out of their belts. Before I could stop Etienne, he stepped towards them and showed them his park warden badge. Do you have a permit for those firearms? He asked them authoritatively. The pair looked at each other dumbfounded before turning and sprinting away. Etienne cussed in French and ran after them. Ignore them, Etienne. Etienne must have heard me because he didn't stop running. Shaking my head, I ran after them, my feet pounding beneath me. The pair crossed the road into the parking lot and jumped into a truck, starting its engine. I followed Etienne's into a jeep, realizing it was his when he opened the door and jumped into the driver's seat. As the truck with the pair drove away, I dove into the passenger seat of the jeep, surprising Etienne. What are you doing? Get out, he snapped. Just drive, I told him instead, and pulled the seatbelt over my chest. Etienne shouted loudly in French and hit the accelerator pushing me back against my seat and causing my hand to slip on the seatbelt buckle. Teacher, Mr. Etienne has, a, has voiced a number of expletives in Quebec French. <laughs> I figured as much, I told Modi as I buckled my seatbelt. What? Etienne glanced at me confusedly before swerving to the jeep into another lane. I could practically feel the slippery iciness of the road. Just focus on the... Someone in the truck was shooting at us. Do we have a gun? The glove compartment, Etienne yelled. Pulling the latch in front of me, the compartment dropped open, revealing a semi-automatic pistol, commonly used to law enforcement. A crack suddenly appeared on the jeep's side mirror. The jeep swerved a little as Etienne leaned over to grab the gun. He started rolling down his window. Pass me the gun. Shocked expression crossed his face. You know how to shoot this thing? Yes. You have a firearms permit? Yes, yes. Canadian firearms permit? Just pass me the damn gun. The driver's seat window shattered as we swerved on the road. Etienne reluctantly passed me the gun as he brought us closer to the truck. I rolled down my window and leaned out of it, feeling the freezing wind blasting my face. Teacher, I must advise us against this course of action. Ignoring Modi, I firmly pointed my gun at the truck's back wheel, feeling the recoil of the gunshot ripple down my arm each time I pulled the trigger. I managed to hit one of the rear lights and adjusted my aim. But before I could pull the trigger, one of their bullets hit our tyres. Swerving wildly from side to side, Etienne started losing control of the jeep. Brace yourself, I screamed, as we headed toward a large, directly for a large tree. Lovely. Pushing away the airbag in front of me, I looked over at Etienne, who was similarly affected by his own airbag. He looked over at me. Are you okay? No, he answered with a pained expression. My jeep's totaled. I breathed a sigh of relief. Come on, we need to get out. Etienne nodded, and we pushed our doors open. I was about to jump out, but my seatbelt was stuck. I tried wrenching myself free, and then I tried giving it a bit of slack, but nothing worked. Hang on, I got this, said the park warden, as he pulled out a Swiss army knife and started sawing at the belt near the buckle. Why not? My car's completely wrecked anyway, he muttered to himself. Teacher, I'm very glad you're unharmed. I'm glad too, I answered. What? Etienne asked, confused, unaware of Moti on my wrist. The seatbelt snapped loose at that moment. 
I wanted to spend another second in the car wreck. I jumped out of it despite the freezing winter weather. That was where I saw it. A large mansion just a few hundred feet away. Some of the lights were still were on. Could they have gone over there? Etienne looked over at the mansion I was pointing at and frowned. No one lives there in winter, he explained. It's a summer home for a rich family from Vancouver. It must be where they went, he concluded. We should go there. Toward the guys with guns? I agree, teacher. This plan seems reckless. Etienne shrugged. It's that or freeze to death out here. He had a point. The park warden walked over to the driver's side of the jeep and picked up his radio. Give me a second to cool this in, then we'll go. I nodded while rubbing my arms to warm up a little. Ten minutes later, we were walking toward the front door of the mansion. The truck we'd been chasing earlier was parked just off to the side of the front door. Etienne and I looked at each other. It was confirmation that they were here. We should check the truck. Etienne nodded in agreement and we moved towards the truck. As we approached it, something by the side of the truck caught my eye. Wait, I told him, and made my way to the object. It was a familiar large chest. Teacher, it's the same type of chest as Professor Sol's research chest. Having a bad feeling, I quickly opened the lid and examined its contents. It was empty, save for a single piece of paper with the professor's handwriting on it. What was the professor's research doing all the way in Canada, and where was its contents? Suddenly I found myself wondering if Flying Falls was more connected to the professor than just his son. What is it? asked Etienne, clearly unfamiliar with his father's research chest. That's your father's research trunk. My dad's? Why would they have my dad's research? Etienne had a puzzled look on his face, which slowly turned into a realization. Are they the ones who killed my dad? I shrugged. It's possible. We stepped cautiously inside the house. The main hallway was empty. A look of determination was suddenly on the park warden's face. He marched deeper into the house. Wait, isn't backup coming? He shook his head. I can't wait. You wait, he simply said before walking on without me. I tried running after him, but when I turned the corner, Etienne was gone, and I couldn't figure out which corridor he went down. After about five minutes of looking around, I stumbled into an important looking room. It looked like a home office. The large mahogany desk in the middle had a framed photograph in a corner, and a map spread open across it. Let's look at the photograph. I picked up the framed photograph and studied it. It was a photograph of two women, one in her 50s and the other in her 20s. The young woman had short red hair while the older woman had long grey hair. They both had white lab coats on and looked like it was taken in a very old laboratory. The photograph was dated only a few months ago. Studying the picture in greater detail, I noted that the two women looked similar. They must be related. This house must belong to them. Do you think the house owners are here, teacher? Alright, we need to wrap this one up because we've been going on for way, way too long. But uh, I, I was hoping we'd get to the end of the second act, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. So we're going to wrap this one up here. If you want to see more, make sure you let me know. At least we'll maybe finish the one story. It's probably got like many, many, many endings, but we should at least run it out to the end of one story, I think. But yeah, let me know what you think anyway. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out for me, and I'll see you in the next one.